Russian advances were changing things in the East. What uh, was a surprise to us, they managed to set up a new production of production lines beyond the reach of our bombers, which was in most cases beyond the Ural Mountains or in, in this area. And they ran up to tremendous production numbers. They came. Better aircraft, all this MiG, Yak, Yak type aircraft, very good. And better trained pilots. And later on, from N42 onwards, they formed these elite units, uh, Red Banner Guard regiments. And in my area, at least in my area, we could identify them because they painted from the nacelle to the cockpit the aircraft in red color. So you could identify these are the elite. This was a very uh, adequate uh, component. A new generation of Russian pilots, together with their more advanced aircraft, would help turn the tide against Germany. Still, the 190 had yet to reach the limits of its versatility. The Russian campaign had shown that the basic German ground attack plane, the Stuka, was obsolete. And when its replacement, the Messerschmitt 210, did not materialize, the reliable 190 was put forward as a substitute. Though not designed specifically to fill this need, the 190 was flexible enough to be adapted. The 190 attack version, or F-series, was much like the basic short-nosed design, although with extra hard points to mount bomb loads on the wing and under the main fuselage. The result was a basic fighter design able to carry bombs as a dedicated attack plane. Versatility wasn't always the answer. As the war in the East continued, German pilots had to contend with very specialized Russian aircraft like the IL-2 Stormovik, which proved a real problem to 190 fighters. The uh, IL-2 was a dangerous airplane, you know. It was very hard uh, to shoot it down because it was heavily armored. Down, downwards, and backwards. We had a gunner in the back and uh, you have to aim very accurately to, to get it, you know? And very easily, I know a lot of pilots who really got rid of the whole ammunition were still flying. The inability of German fighters to stop Soviet aircraft, like the Stormovik, certainly influenced the tank battles on the Eastern Front. These duels in armor really produced the outcome of the Russian campaign. Adding to Germany's plight, huge quantities of Allied munitions were now being shipped to the south in a campaign to ensure that Russia lacked for nothing in her fight against Germany. We got to Iran on the uh, land lease program, the uh, Spitfire, the P-39, the B-25, the Boston bomber, and uh, in the south there was a high percentage uh, of those aircraft, uh, Anglo-American uh, origin. This policy of supplying the Soviets from Western production lines ensured that the beleaguered German war machine was kept under constant pressure by the Red Forces in the East and by the British and the Americans from the South and West. But tactics varied. The Soviets concentrated heavily on the ground war and the aircraft they used supported this policy. Whereas the Americans, devotees of the long-range heavy bomber concept, took their war to Germany from the air. By the end of 1944, American daytime bombing was putting dreadful pressure on Luftwaffe fighter defenses. Messerschmitt 109s and all versions of the FW-190 were pressed into service in an attempt to stem the tide of B-17s and Liberators as they wreaked destruction on the fatherland. But the success of US bombing could only come after the planes had battled past the German defenses. And to achieve this end, 
First, long-range, high-speed American escort fighters would be employed, giving protection as far into Germany as possible. And then the bombers would be grouped together in what became known as tight boxed formations, which enabled the gunners to maximize defensive fire. Now the American bombers continued their missions, specifically targeting the main contributors to the German war effort. Ammunition factories, refineries, and most of all, of course, aircraft factories. The theory behind American strategic bombing had always been to deny the enemy the ability to produce weapons. Damage right at the source of production was the most efficient form of warfare. But this only worked when the enemy made his weapons in a conventional way. And that's not how Court Tank envisaged FW-190 production. Hundreds of subcontractors spread across the nation actually increased the supply of parts despite the bomber attacks. And the flow of new 190s coming off the production lines continued to the amazement of American planners. Colonel Fred McIntosh of Air Force Intelligence explains. They were made in sections in small factories and then they were put together at an airport. And then the airplane, even then, may or may not be flown from there and but towed down the highway to the place to where the engine could be involved or whatever was necessary. And the place that would make very fine furniture, in other words, the woodwork and cabinet shop, was making tail assemblies for airplanes. What the 8th Air Force had to contend with was a well-organized network of cottage industries, almost impossible to identify as a strategic target. These tiny factories worked on, completely immune to the 8th Air Force's endeavors. And the fact that they were so successful can be traced back to Focke-Wulf's original idea to subcontract and diversify as many of the production elements of the 190 as possible. Even as the war rolled on to its conclusion, the basic radial-powered 190 was still a match for anything that the Allies could put into the air. But Allied designs had improved. Planes like the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, which had also been designed around a radial engine, arrived in large numbers and with well-trained pilots. There was carnage on both sides, and often the B-17s that did get home brought with them plenty of evidence of just how effective German 190s were in the defense of the homeland. Even though their cause was lost, Luftwaffe pilots hard-pressed for fuel and ammunition still offered a defiant resistance. But the bomber raids would continue on as German defenses slowly melted away and the German people were left with only the ruins of a Reich that was supposed to last a thousand years. Around the now occupied country, American Air Force intelligence teams moved quickly to collect examples of German technology before they were destroyed by retreating troops. It was a risky business. Some aircraft had been wrecked by their German crews and others had even been booby-trapped. But mostly they were just simply standing, abandoned as tools for a war that could not be won. In this way, Allied intelligence came across scores of FW-190s, providing many specimens to examine and compare. 